morning or good evening or good afternoon. Um, I'm very uh, honored uh, to be joining a wonderful speakers today. Um, uh, we'll be talking about the pearl, surgical pearls of um, uh, congenital cataract surgeries. So let me um, share my slides first. Um, we have lots of, uh, 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 we got a lot to talk about and I'm truly excited. Um, uh, and we're gonna try to finish uh, in 60 minutes. Um, and first, before I start, I would like to thank the um, uh, thank everyone for your support. We have over uh, 2,000, I think I was told that we had 2,066 um, uh, professionals uh, that signed up uh, for this meeting, um, probably over many, many countries. And uh, Orbis uh, uh, is, um, uh, we have uh, our reach in almost every single country is around the world. And I'm truly uh, just, just I couldn't be more honored and more uh, excited uh, to be part of Orbis. And I would like to uh, thank our uh, co-presenters. Uh, co um, uh, they don't need much uh, introduction. Uh, Srijana Adkari from Kinganga Institute um, from Nepal, uh, which I think is one of the best institutes in the, in the world. And Ramesh uh, Kekunya, um, he's the, uh, the chief and also the director of uh, LV Prasad Eye Institute in India. Um, again, I think it's uh, one of the best institutes um, in the world. And I um, am from Galvin Herbert Eye Institute here at UCI from USA. So I'm gonna be uh, talking about some of the surgical pearls. We only have about um, 15 minutes for each one of us to talk about uh, these important topics. So I'm going to be talking about the intercapsule, and uh, Ramesh will talk about the IOL selections and placement. And then Dr. Adkari will be talking about the poster capsule and vitreous management. So we're not going to be uh, talking about the the, the entire um, uh, the cataract surgical pearls, but we're going to just focus on these particular topics. And if there are uh, certain uh, topics that you would like for us to um, uh, address in the future, then you could uh, leave us a comment. I'm going to be asking eight quick questions and only going to give you 10 seconds to respond. So if you could just read these uh, questions, um, please let us know. Uh, I am general ophthalmologist, optometrist, pediatric ophthalmologist, or orthoptist, or ophthalmic technician, or doctor in training, or other. If you could click uh, and let us know. Okay, great. So a majority of us are general ophthalmologist and pediatric ophthalmologist. Next question is that I perform congenital cataracts and I would like to see roughly what is the volume? Is it uh, none, uh, one a week, one a month, uh, two or three a week, uh, four to five a week or greater than five a week? Okay, perfect. Next is that how do you um, perform, for those who perform the surgeries, how do you perform the anterior capsulotomy? Um, um, as most of you are general ophthalmologists and you're going to be using something that you're comfortable with. Is it the curved linear capsorexis, the, the traditional method? Is it the vitrexis, can opener, two incision push and pull, rexis or femtosecond laser, plasma blade, or precision pulse capsulotomy, or dithermy or other? Perfect. This is exactly what I expected. Thank you. Next is... Um, um, do you perform dye-assisted capsulotomy in congenital cataract cases? Yes or no? And for those who perform the surgeries. Um, so, okay, majority says yes. And what do you use for the, uh, for the staining? Is it ICG, autologous blood, fluorescein, uh, gentian of, um, violet, or tripan blue, or other? Uh, if you, for those who are using the, uh, the dye, okay, it's a tripan blue because it's easily accessible and it's cheap, okay? And how do you manage the posterior capsule? Never remove, um, obviously for many of you who are general ophthalmologists that you're not used to removing the posterior capsule, um, um, but for these congenital cataracts, obviously the managing the posterior capsule is very important and it looks like the answer, it kind of goes all over the place. Never remove to place IOL first, then removing with the vitrexis, a vitro, vitrector or manual pusher, a primary pusher capsulotomy than IOL or vitrectomy pusher capsule removal than IOL. Okay, perfect. Uh, what age uh, do you perform, uh, at what age do you perform the po uh, primary pusher capsulotomy with anterior vitrectomy? Um, for those 
who manage the posterior uh, capsule with the vitrectomy. At what age do you do you primary posterior capsulotomy, capsulectomy with the anterior vitrectomy? Okay, uh, up to three. Okay, next question. The last question is after what age do you do primary posterior capsulotomy um, without anterior vitrectomy, meaning um, you just leave the uh, the vitreous alone and you just simply remove the posterior capsule at what age? One through five. Okay. So uh, after it looks like uh, it's uh, greater than five and okay, perfect. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you. That kind of gives us an idea of uh, where the audience um, understanding is, and I think we can taper our talk. Um, I've been doing congenital cataract surgery for 23 years, and I'm going to just tell you, um, I, although I had a excellent training, uh, the danger is always working around. Um, you know, you think that everything's going to go okay, and then bam, something just comes and, um, and bites you. Um, and, and these things um, are sometimes very unpredictable. So uh, in my opinion, uh, the success hinges on the planning. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is that hope for the best, but plan for the worst. I think this is truly the key to uh, success in these congenital cataract surgeries. Um, um, so what I mean by that is that the First, you need to test the water. Before you start the case, I think just the planning portion, I think is just as important as the procedure in itself. Um, so assess the anterior chamber depth. How shallow is it? And the size of the pupil, is it something that uh, you feel comfortable doing the cataract surgery? And as you know, mom, and many of these uh, congenital cataract patients, they tend to uh, have smaller pupils. And, um, and if you're not able to dilate, that's gonna cause a significant problem. Uh, and size of the eye, especially in uh, persistent fetal vasculatures. And then location of the cataract, where is the opacity? Is it in the periphery? Is it in the posterior capsule? And especially the traumatic cataracts, uh, where it's the, one of the most common cause of cataracts, as you know, uh, we have to worry about the zonule status. Um, what, what is the, where is the, uh, the torn zonules that you have to be concerned about? And then anterior segment dysgenesis. Um, uh, this may not be very um, obvious. Um, you know, patients with the iris defects or ciliary body defects or lens defects, it's very easy. Uh, but there may be some corneal endothelial dystrophy that you may not be aware of. I recently had a case that patient developed a corneal um, edema that just wouldn't resolve and in, ended up need, needing corneal endothelial, endothelial uh, transplantation. Uh, and the view of the posterior capsule uh, and the vitreous uh, sometimes can be uh, difficult, especially for these uh, uh, dense cataracts. You have no idea what the posterior capsule status is, is there posterior lenticonus even? Um, unless you're performing an ultrasound, you may not know. And then uh, the second tip is that along with the, uh, the planning, I think it's extremely important to keep your technique as simple as possible. Steve Jobs said that the keeping things simple, it's actually much harder than keeping things complex. Um, keeping things simple, it not just uh, it makes you plan ahead easier. Um, but if you run into trouble, you will know you will have a plan A, plan B and plan C all planned out. But if you're making things very complicated, then it uh, then it, it can actually get very, very confusing, not just for you, but for the people that are assisting you. Um, and then third tip is that have the favorite instrument ready, whatever that is. And sometimes your OR may not have these instruments um, uh, for you then you may have to go out and purchase them on your own. I, you know, that's perfectly okay. And these, uh, for, um, uh, for these small, uh, small eyes, micro utratus, a micro forcep, um, um, and there are many out there. I think it's extremely uh, helpful. Uh, and there are different companies uh, that uh, make these. And by the way, I have, we have no, none of us uh, have any financial interest. Um, and then if you're gonna use uh, making a larger incision that's greater than 1.8 millimeters, then um, uh, just you could use a, a regular utrata, which is which I think is just fine. Um, but 
I think it's very important that you have your favorite instrument ready, but also make sure they work. Um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, I've actually seen some of the uh, the, uh, the poll, question, uh, poll answers, and some of you do uh, one surgery a month or one or two cases a month. Well, in those cases, these instruments may be put aside and it may not be well kept. And sometimes the, these tooth or the, uh, the, the tip do not meet. And it can make the case extremely frustrating. So having some backup instruments is extremely critical. So let's talk about the intercapsule surgical management. Um, what makes the, the surgery so difficult? The interchamber in these small eyeballs is definitely shallow. Um, and it is, it's a smaller eye. And the sclera is less rigid with a lower pressure. And then the, on top of that, the lens is more convex shaped and the intercapsule is thinner and it's more elastic. So as you can see, it's a combination of these four things that can make the tear run in unusual fashion compared to the adult patients. And on top of that, the lens, uh, you may not be able to see the posterior capsule. Um, um, so the um, so hydro dissection can be somewhat challenging and uh, and uh, maybe actually even dangerous. Um, so let's talk about the viscoelastic. Uh, so there, um, most of the viscoelastic um, uh, fall into one of two categories: is is there dispersive, or cohesive, and there are some um, uh, viscoelastic that are hybrid, uh, which is perfectly okay, uh, but. For, the, for those who are learning uh, the cataracts um, and who are for the beginners, I definitely think that cohesive um, viscoelastic would definitely make things easier um, because what it does is that with the cohesive, uh, heavier, higher molecular weight viscoelastic then te that tends to deform the lens and make the lens flatter. As a matter of fact, if you over inflate the interior chamber, that lens, instead of being convex, you can even make it concave so that when you're uh, tearing the uh, anterior capsule, it will tend not toward peripherally, but it will tend more centrally. And that's a tip that I would like to recommend to you. So if you have a, uh, if you want to have the, the tear run more centrally, toward the center, over inflating the uh, anterior chamber just slightly with the high molecular weight uh, OBD can be very, very helpful. And also by you doing that, you're stretching the anterior capsule and making it more taut. So what you're doing is that you're, you're when you're cutting something, watch. See, with my right hand, I'm pulling in downward fashion but you need the counter traction with my left hand here. So if there's no left hand, it's much harder to tear. So that by providing this, by flattening the intercapsule and keeping it taut, you're, you're creating a counter traction to, to, to make the tear more controllable. And these are the list of the, um, the uh, high molecular weight of the, and this is what the interior lens looks like. So when you're tearing in this direction uh, to the left, there has to be a counter traction. Without that counter traction, you are not going to tear anything in any controllable fashion. Um, so the, that's where the tear goes in the blue line. So in a convex, smaller uh, congenital cataract, when you're pulling in this direction, there is going to be a radial force toward the equator because it's it's in a slope fashion. So what's happening is that you're not cutting in a straight fashion like this, you're cutting more at an angle. And of course, the pair is going to be more at an angle, as you can see here. Okay? Um, so the tear is going to go more toward the equator in this fashion. So if you want to pull, if you pull in this direction, if, um, if you want the tear to go in this direction, you have to go more centripetally, more to the center. Okay. Um, but again, uh, you're not pulling always toward the center. It's a tendential force along with the centripetal force. You're constantly changing the direction. So I just want you to think about this, okay? You're not pulling always toward the centripetal, toward the center. You're going tendential and then central, uh, central tendential, central. 
you're constantly changing directions. Um, and also, uh, the um, uh, so this is how I create the intercapsulotomy. So I create just, I find the center of the, the pupil and I go slightly higher and slightly um, nasal. And then I make a, a one millimeter, uh, uh, excuse me, 0.5 millimeter horizontal and then upward um, uh, incision. I, so basically what you're doing, what I'm doing is that I'm creating a, a flap. Um, some people talk about just trying to make it like a small smile, but uh, for me, it's harder to create that flap that I could grasp on. So I go horizontal. Sometimes I, I even go slightly inferiorly, but it's mostly it's uh, horizontal, then upward, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and trying to create that flap. And once I create that flap, then I tend to go counterclockwise direction. I've done both clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise. But for me, I'm right-handed person going counterclockwise um, initially helps me to, um, uh, to avoid the blind spot that I would create in the infra uh, nasal quadrant initially. And then as I'm pulling, I'm always doing the centripetal and tangential force back and forth, back and forth. And the angle that I'm trying to aim for is about, uh, the size is about five millimeters. That's the ideal size. And uh, it's very important, especially for the beginners uh, to do frequent grasping. And in, when I first started, I think I grasped more than eight times. So what you're doing is that you're trying to grasp closer to the initiation of the flap. Uh, so you're getting closer that, so that you can have more control. And then viscoelastic. So if you, as you're uh, creating this, uh, creating this uh, cover, uh, cover linear capsorexis, some of the vitreous is leaving and the lens is reforming and becoming more convex again. So when, uh, so longer you take to uh, create this uh, uh, capsorexis, more of the vitreous will be leaving, exiting. So it's uh, don't be afraid to add additional physical elastic to flatten or to make the lens more concave. Um, and another thing that I just want to make sure that uh, I tell you is that when I'm training my uh, fellows and my residents, sometimes they're very uncomfortable and then they're holding their breath. Um, so make sure you breathe and do it slowly and then if you're not in a comfortable position and if you're in ergonomically, if you're not comfortable, this whole thing's going to be very uncomfortable. So make sure you have the microscope, your chair, the bed, everything in the right height so that you are completely comfortable. And I, I think this is one of the biggest steps that I can um, tell you. And then also, as you're creating this flap, and if you see it going radial, more centripetally toward the equator, don't even think about uh, trying to, um, you know, especially for the beginners, uh, you can inject more viscoelastic to make it more concave. But if you see things that are not going well, just stop and then come out and just rethink. And then I always have these uh, micro scissors or micro retinal scissors or just micro capsulotomy scissors always ready. And these are, um, you know, this is something you could purchase. And I, I would make an incision um, and retract it in this fashion, and then re-grasp and then complete the task. Um, and there are different types of micro scissors that's available. That's, um, and some people avoid the uh, curvilinear capsorexis altogether, and they go straight to the vitractor, which I think is okay, um, especially for younger patients, less than two or three, I think it's perfectly okay. Um, it, uh, um, and there, you know, people uh, have different preferences. Uh, many places around the country, I think, uh, uh, you know, we are using 23 gauge, but around the world, I know that many are using 20 gauge vitrector, which I think works beautifully. And then tripen blue, I'm not sure if it really stiffens the intercapsule. I don't think it really does. Um, and I've done I literally, uh, you know, uh, I want to say thousands of, of these uh, trap and blue, and I really don't see a much huge difference, but I do think that it improves the uh, visualization. So I do I like, um, you know, especially in these very dense, uh, especially in these white cataracts, it helps me to see where the edges are. 
Um, and then uh, the uh, if you feel that the iris is uh, the uh, the uh, the pupil is too small and you don't feel comfortable, and after you inject viscoelastic and you're trying to enlarge the pupil, but if it doesn't enlarge because of the posterior synechiae or from iritis or trauma. Don't even think twice about putting a pupil dilator. And there are many different types out there um, uh, because if you can't see the edge of that, um, uh, the flap, uh, the, the, there's no way the case is gonna go smoothly. So it's very important. And so tips, um, so while I'm playing this, uh, cohesive viscoelastic, especially for the beginners. And I think as you have more experience, uh, then I don't think it really matters uh, too much. Uh, but for the beginners, uh, cohesive uh, viscoelastic, try you, uh, um, make sure you do that. And then try you used to use the tripen blue. Um, um, and because it does, as you can see there, even for these, um, it, it's not a dense cataract, um, but you can see, you can see the capsule, uh, the, you have a better visualization. And, and also pull more centrally, but it's more central and tangential force, okay, is a combination of those. So if it tends to go more peripherally, you're pulling more toward the center. But if it's going to, if you're, if it's, if the tear is going more toward the center, then you want to do it more tangentially. And it's the combination of that that, that will help you to create this nice uh, circular opening. And make sure you take frequent bites and try to get closer to the edge of the flap, which will give you a better um, uh, control. Thank you. Um, we're gonna have uh, Ramesh talk about lens management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Uh, I'll be talking about some tips about IOL placement, various techniques which uh, works for me. Uh, this is uh, a step already Dr. Sue has alluded to different steps involved in pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, I'm only going to focus on the IOL implantation as well as lens aspiration. So you have this set of uh, incisions and uh, either corneal, steril, superior, temporal, all that is there. Once you have this uh, you know, uh, capsular axis, as uh, shown by Dr. Sue, we have to do the lens aspiration. And one thing I must say that in most of the kids, it's better to suture, especially in infants and toddlers. So if you see what power of intraocular lens should be used and what is the different types of eye lens power calculation. So there is no consensus yet because all of them have a uh, equally similar absolute prediction error. So one of the simplest formula you can use is H plus under correction should be equal to seven. This is one of the rough way of estimating what kind of intraocular lens we are going to put. This is, we have even validated a one-year-old child, we have followed them up for uh, eight years or 10 years, and then we have seen the validation of these guidelines. So very quickly going through some of the steps, I, I'm not going to cover the anterior capsular axis. One of the question everybody asks is, do we have to do a hydro delineation procedure? Most often it is not, not required. Uh, in my personal view, I never do any kind of hydro delineation or hydro dissection procedure. This uh, material, they come very, very easily in a bimanual technique. Maybe less than 5% of the cases, you have to use uh, some kind of PECO power or things like that. Once you have that, uh, you can make the post capsulotomy. Again, I'm not going into the detail because Dr. Adhikari will try that. Uh, once you have this uh, opening there, one of the simplest way of implanting the lens is the leading haptic should go into the bag. After you inflate the overall bag, the leading haptic, if it goes inside along with some portion of the optic, then your implantation becomes uh, very easy 
trailing haptic, you can just uh, imagine. This is one of the surgeries which I've done during the Flying Eye Hospital program. Probably I think it's in Bangladesh. As you can see, the trailing haptic, you can just nudge it in, and then you have this uh, in the bag implantation of the legs. One of the tip I would like to share here is uh, you, in addition to doing a lens aspiration, this is one maneuver I do it, where the under surface of the anterior capsule is polished very nicely throughout 360 degree. With the low aspiration, we can uh, aspirate all these lens epithelial cells because this makes uh, you know the future lens epithelial proliferation less and related uh, complications along with that. So this is one of the maneuver uh, I do. It takes uh, really a lot of time compared to a lens aspiration. This is one thing I feel uh, it is uh, helping. You have to do it in both the sides. So once you have done that, uh, you know, aspiration, then you have the either one piece lens, either SA or SN series, do not have any financial uh, interest or a three piece lens. People have done optic capture, iris claw lenses, and also in the bag. So this is again, I'm showing the implantation technique with the leading haptic go inside very slowly. You need to have this three-dimensional picture of the bag highly inflated so that there is no panic to put the lens in the bag. You know, you can see the 25% of the lens is in the bag. What you have to do is, again, uh, decrease sometimes. You can see in this case, what is happening is the haptic is not gone inside completely. The, the trailing haptic, you have to use an instrument where you have to just go inside, use ample amount of viscoelastic, and then just match this lens because I'm again showing the uh, implantation of the lens in the bag because this is live, what is happening. Sometimes you may not have this whole lens coming, just nudge it. And then this is also a useful technique in posterior lenticonus. You can see, hold at the optic and haptic junction, and then don't put too much of a pressure. No real dialing is required. You just have to guide it inside the bag. Once you have done, if the vitrectum, everything is complete, you just have to position the lens and put the suture or hydro dissection. So this is the way you can implant the lens and post a capsulotomy. I'm not going to touch because Dr. Adhikari is going to touch that uh, topic. I just wanted to show one more uh, way of implanting the three piece lens. In this case, what I'm trying to do is a uh, capture. I will just uh, run through it again so that uh, you can see just nice day so that the, the haptic goes behind the posterior capsule. This is the way. You can do optic capture, especially when you use a three-piece lens in the sulcus. Uh, it'll be really useful. There are different types of posterior lenticonus. The lens aspiration as well as the implantation technique is different depending upon the stage of this lenticonus. You can see the first picture and the second, third picture showing this fishtail sign and the corresponding B scan and the the uh, UBM and the Pentacam picture. So when you have an intact capsule, as you can see that there is a big crater of the weakness of the posterior capsule, what you can do is you can implant the lens in these kind of cases, just implant as usual, because the crater is so large, if you try to do a retract uh, PPC there, the whole lens can collapse and uh, you will have a drop. Once you have done that, that crater part, you can go through the vitrector. As Dr. Sue said, I generally use uh, 25 gaze and uh, you can see behind the lens, you can go and then complete this uh, procedure. Sometimes capsular defect will be there. 
before itself. You can see this fish tail sign in the second video. So in these cases, you need to be careful. Uh, once you aspirate everything, do a vitrectomy. Even at this stage, you can decide whether you're going to implant a three-piece lens or you're going to implant a single-piece lens. In this patient, I'm implanting a three-piece lens. You can see, again, nudging so that the posterior capsule and the anterior capsule are seen and your lens is in the bag. And if there is any residual uh, vitreous there, you can complete the vitrectomy there. Uh, one, one simple tool I use in my practice, this is obviously a case of PEFT, persistent fetal vasculature, as you can see here. Uh, after doing aspiration, this case was a uh, uh, you know, simple, minor PVFP, I must say. I use this endocautery. I also use this peekaboo sign where inject a little bit of air and you can do an intraoperative examination of the posterior pole with an inexpensive way. Just by injecting the air, you can adjust the microscope and you can get it. This is one of the surgery of the PSPV. I just wanted to show because sometimes the anterior and the posterior capsule can be joined together. What I do in these cases, I use an endocautery. This is this is one of my colleagues' uh, uh, surgery. You can see she is trying to uh, do this uh, cautery everywhere uh, using this, you know, so that this is already uh, cauterized so that you will not have any kind of uh, bleeding. See that? That's the point where you can use this endocautery. So after doing it, there is no way you can do a lens aspiration and probably an implantation in this patient. You can see the elongated process of the ciliary processes. And then you might have to use, as Dr. Sue showed, you need to have different instrumentation for doing pediatric cataract. And these instruments becomes very handy in each of those cases. And uh, finally, you might have to eat around the skirt using a uh, vitrector. So this is one of the cases where there is aniridia with the posterior antiponus. Very similar technique. We could implant this uh, in this patient. And some Sometimes it will be a nightmare where your pupil is not dilated. So probably you have to use uh, some kind of hooks. I typically use the iris hook in this kind of uh, situation. You can see once I use the hook, pupil is dilated nicely. I can see the whole part of the lens and I can do the lens aspiration. Uh, capsulorexis and even implantation and then trying to do the uh, rexis part also and trying to do it. So that's about uh, the posterior lenticonus and other types. One of the questions always asked is whether to implant in the lens, uh, implant the lens in an infant or not. This is the criteria I use, the preoperative factors intraoperative factors and the socioeconomic factors. If these things are taken care, of, in this case, as you can see, biometry is good, no other call, uh, ocular comorbidities, and intraoperative is there are no complications, I probably put an implant in an infant. There are other newer techniques, which uh, I may not touch uh, because of the want of uh, time, there is a uh, Zepto, uh, as you can see here, precision pulse capsulotomy. These are all uh, instrument. If you don't have experience, probably in older age uh, group, you can use this because in pediatric cataract surgery, anterior capsular excess is the most difficult part. With this uh, nitinol ring, with 90 seconds, you can get an equally good uh, uh, Capsulorexis, only thing is it is expensive and this is not possible in very, very small kids because intended capsulorexis becomes a little bit bigger. That's the problem what you have with uh, these kind of uh, recent advances in uh, pediatric cataract surgery. You can see the, the capsule is there. So 
this is the long term of this patient and you can use uh, some of these patients with the intumescent lens also you can uh, use this kind of uh, procedure and uh, you can get a good uh, capsule of axis. And in this patient, after polishing, I'm trying to put a, in the bag lens, you can see this. This is uh, one of the patients where I'm trying to do the capsule or axis. Dr. Tazignon from Belgium, she has developed this lens in the bag. Uh, one of the advantages in the long term, the visual axis opacification rate is very, very uh, minimal, I would say almost nil with this kind of uh, lenses. This is the long term uh, follow up. You can see this patient over a period of time what has happened. I just wanted to show always expect the unexpected. So I just wanted to show this uh, complication. Just watch the video. So at this stage, because of the irrigation flow was more, you can see the lens is sinking. So what to do in this kind of situations? What you, the best thing you can do is a good vitrectomy and then call your retina colleagues because going and fishing this is not a good idea because this can happen when you do 1,000 cases or 2,000 cases or it can be a 50th case. So as we call the retinal surgeons, you can see what happened. Lens is trying to come up. So what happened in this case is the lens really drowned, but some unusual mystery happened. The lens came up on its own. This is a, both the things are very rare. I just wanted to show that. And the last slide I wanted to show is whenever you follow up this patient, do a real follow up. Real is the mnemonic for refraction, visual acuity high pressure, alignment, amblyopia, and IOL-related parameters. Every single time, you need to check this when they come for follow-up. So this is important. And uh, it's a long journey from this baby to get through this over a 20-year uh, period. It's a long journey, but uh, it's challenging. With the help of uh, ophthalmologists around the world, even if you're a pediatric ophthalmologist or general ophthalmologist, we can provide a good care to provide a very good vision for these children. This is one of the families where, uh, you know, all the four children have cataract and then we implant the, the lens when they are two and a half or three months of age and they are enjoying good vision. I'm going to talk about a posterior capsular management. Good morning, and good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Srizana from Nepal. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest or financial disclosure. So whenever we do posterior capsular management, why it is important? The incidence of the posterior capsule opacity is 100% in children without the posterior capsule management. And with the advancement of technologies and best surgical approach, even with that, the incidence reduces, but PCO is still the most common complications after pediatric cataract surgery. So uh, how it occurs, the etiology is basically the retained epithelial cells that proliferate and migrate onto the posterior capsule surface. The capsule itself doesn't uh, 
um, opacify, but the, uh, the cells that migrate into and anterior epithelial cells, that is A cells undergo fibrotic metaplasia and then responsible for fibrotic PCO and equatorial lens both bo cells, that is E cells and with active mitosis and migrations are responsible for pearls or cluster PCO. So most of the time we, we see these kind of posterior capsular opacities after pediatric cataract surgeries. Now the key factors that are responsible for posterior capsule management. What are the most important things whenever we talk about posterior capsule management, that is age of the child and the surgical procedure, that is primary posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy, either alone or with anterior vitrectomy, which is our mandatory routine procedure, should be the mandatory routine procedure in uh, posterior capsule manage management in pediatric cataract surgery. And the surgical approach, like uh, whether pars plana or limber approach, which I'll talk a little later, and other factors that are um, uh, required for the prevention of the posterior capsule opacities and which play the important roles are the types of IOLs that we uh, use, the placements of the IOL, the cortical cleanup and management of the postoperative inflammations. These are also very much important to prevent posterior capsular opacity in pediatric cataract surgeries. Now the frequently asked questions, Till what is the capsulotomy needs to be done and when to perform anterior vitrectomy along with the posterior capsulotomy, how much vitreous to be removed or how deep to go and which approach, pars plana or the limbal approach. So now let's talk about the A's of the posterior uh, capsule management. So PPC, that is primary posterior capsulotomy is done usually up to the eight of A's, uh, A's of eight years. That is a common practice because the reason behind this is we think that beyond this age, the child would be cooperative enough for subsequent laser uh, treatment. And also the PCO formation becomes less frequent or thinner. But the question arises, a cooperative child or at age of five years of age, would you do the uh, primary posterior capsule to me or just leave? But you, one thing you should be very um, careful about is that being co cooperative for the yak capsule to me should not be the only deciding factor because the PCO that is formed will be very thick, fibrotic, and difficult to break with the yak laser. And another important thing is that the YAC capsulotomy does not break the anterior vitreous phase opacification. And that also should always be kept in mind. And that's why there is a chance of recurrent PCO in these cases. If you plan to do YAC capsulotomy later, sometimes the decision may be wrong. So you have to be very careful in these situations. Now, the sometimes in older children, more than eight years or seven, eight years, we have to do primary posterior capsulotomy in, in older children in certain circumstances, like in children with the nystagmus, where it is difficult to do a yak capsulotomy later. Uh, similarly, mental retardations, and if the child has poor follow-up in the rural areas, like in countries like Nepal, sometimes the children cannot come for the follow-up and we cannot monitor the posterior capsule opacity. And others are like type of cataracts, if there is pre-existing posterior capsule defect, traumatic cataracts, Attract with fibrotic membrane, posterior capsule plaque, posterior lentiglobus, in which their capsular flutter uh, defect, uncontrolled capsule extensions occurs, and PHPV. So in these situations also, we have to do the posterior capsule uh, management even after in the, in the older age as well. And now the, another thing is whether PPC with or without vitrectomy, usually the common practice is with the vitrectomy up to the eight age of five years. And without vitrectomy, uh, only the posterior capsulotomy from five to eight years, that is a rough of eight years, the, but it depends on the individual practice, also the clinical judgment and surgeon's decisions. And whenever we are doing without vitrectomy, one should be very careful that the vitreous prolapse may be there. So it should be ruled out if it, there is vitreous prolapse. And if it is there, it should be managed very properly. Now the techniques of primary posterior capsule, how we can perform that, that is one manual continuous curvilinear capsulorexis with needle with the capsulorexis forceps. And another uh, options are radiofrequency diathermy, vitrectorexis, which is also easy and popular. And of course the ND YAG laser capsulotomy later. And uh, the manual capsulotomy, now whenever to, we talk about manual capsulotomy, the use of coisy viscoelastic substance helps to manage the capsule. And we have to be very careful in uh, looking at the signs of vitreous prolapse. 
uh, the shape of the anterior and posterior capsule should be looked at because it can be irregular tainting and strands of the vitreous can be pulling the capsule. So vitreous incarceration can be there in the wound. In these situations, the triamcelone assisted capsulotomy helps a lot to visualize the vitreous and these strands and leaking of the vitreous. And the, now the size, how, much, how, long, how large should be done? It should be centered and around 4.5 to 5 millimeter diameter can be there. But if you are planning to leave the child FAK, then both the anterior and posterior capsule can be of equal size, large and sufficient to put secondary IL implantations uh, afterwards. Now the surgical approach is either limbal or pars plana approach. So it also depends on surgeon's preference. The studies have shown no significant difference between the two approaches. The anterior segment surgeons commonly prefer the limbal approach anterior and the anterior vitrectomy. Now how much to do or what to depth? It is not possible to measure exactly. So it, it, uh, the experience you can learn by the experience, but you don't have to do very deep in the core vitrectomy. It's just the, just the anterior vitreous that is lying around the capsulotomy that is there. You can remove up to those. Now the limbal, let's talk about a little bit about limbal approach. It is easy, sufficient to enough, uh, the limbal approach, through this limbal approach, they're sufficient to remove small portion of the anterior vitreous that is required in the pediatric cataract surgery. And the PPC in limbal approach can be done vitrectomy PPC or vitrectomy before the IL implantations or PPC or vitrectomy after the IL implantations. So if you are doing before the IL implantation, which is a, which is a common practice, but sometimes insertion of IOL in the bag is a little difficult and it's a practice, and but easy to do optic capture with the haptic in the sulcus in these situations. And if you are doing PPC, Posterior capsule of uh, PPC uh, and vitrectomy after the IL implantations, then IL insertion in the bag is easy because you'll get intact bag. But getting beneath the IL, um, the getting beneath the IL may cause decentrations of the IL and manual CCC in this situation is very difficult. So this is the limbal approach. And another approach is a pars plana approach, which uh, some of the surgeons uh, use this and uh, it is also popular. And in this case, uh, either PPC vitrectomy after the IL implantation can be done, or if you're not putting any IL in that case, also pars plana vitrectomy can be done or the lensectomy is planned, then it can be done. There is a less chance of vitreous prolapse and large opening can be made easily without any tension of dropping the IL or decentration of the IL, but little extra training is needed for the anterior segment surgeon. And another thing is entry site should be is very important because we are uh, working on a very small um, children. So uh, how much posterior to go from the limbus for the pars plana approach, you should, uh, uh, it varies in different ages. So we have to know that very carefully, two millimeter posterior the limbus in younger than one, 2.5 to one to four years and three millimeters. So roughly we have to take care of these things whenever we are doing pars plana approach. Now the optic capture has already been um, um, uh, explained by Dr. Ramesh, and this is also one of the technique in which the, um, uh, to prevent the posterior capsule opacity. And then the studies have shown that the optic capture and PPC without vitrectomy has a equal outcome. So optic capture, a little difficult procedure, but with the training you can do very quickly and um, uh, we, you can learn. And this is an easy way to um, uh, prevent the posterior capsule opacity and it's a popular uh, technique. Now, some not very commonly practiced techniques of posterior capsule management, that is uh, posterior vertical capsulectomy with optic entrapment. I'm just, I'll just mention these techniques because these are found in the literature and bag in the aisle. That's what Dr. Ramesh explained uh, about that uh, technique. Uh, uh, he uh, explained that, and it is a bag in the lens that also prevents the PCO, cortical cleaving hydrodissection, sutureless vitrectomy, and then sealed capsule irrigation, if you using device, a Milvella device. So these are some of the uh, not very commonly used techniques that has been available in the literature. Now, possible downside of the PPC and antivitrectomy can be cystoid macular edema if we are opening the capsule and the vitreous and the retinal detachment. But the studies have shown that the risk is very small and as equal as a capsulotomy later. So, without any doubt, we can very easily and we can we have to mandatorily do posterior capsule um, uh, management, posterior capsulotomy and antivitrectomy in smaller children. 
And some of the videos, I just want to show how I do, I prefer to do uh, the management of the posterior capsule to me. This is my regular case, but uh, a slightly irregular because um, uh, slightly unusual because the, um, the pupil was difficult to dilate and I just put uh, dilate diluted adrenaline uh, and just asking from my nearby anesthetic colleagues and if the pupil got nicely dilated, I most of the cases I do uh, anterior capsulotomy by the vitrectorexis and with the same cannula with the 23 case uh, vitrectomy cannula, uh, remove the posterior, uh, the cortical matter. And then on um, after that, after removing the cortical matter, I put the lens first. Most of the time, I put the IOL first and then uh, just lens in the bag. And then the posterior capsule. So this is my regular case. So sometimes we get like on uh, the large posterior lentiglobus. In these situations, what happens is that you don't know whether there is a posterior capsule defect or not, how much defect is there. So it is difficult. In this case, there was a large posterior capsular defect and the vitreous was coming in between. So in these cases, this uh, vitrectomy cannula is becomes very, very handy in these situations. I did just I just did vitrectomy, vitrectorexis with the anterior capsule, vitrectorexis, and then after that. Uh, clean the cortical matter with the cannula. After this, uh, just uh, found that there was a large posterior capsular defect with the extension of the capsule. So in this situation, what I did was I just did uh, I just put the lens in the sulcus. That is, uh, uh, um, this is the type of lens that we produce in our Tilganga lab. It is a square is a lens that can be very easily go into the sulcus. And then that's why, and after that, I close my case. So this is how I manage the posterior lentiglobus, which was quite large. There's another case of the fibrotic posterior capsule, um, pre-existing um, capsular plaque was there. And then uh, I did um, an manual, um, this uh, vitrectorexis again, and then lens aspiration, and the, that plaque is left behind at first, and then after the IOL insertion, the capsule was, the capsular plaque was removed. So this is another way the pupil was a little bit uh, smaller in this case, but could be managed, it was, a, a, it was manageable. So these, these are some of the easy techniques that you can follow, uh, which I follow usually uh, in, my post, in my congenital cataract surgery cases, and then we go beneath, beneath the lens. So if you are using the vitrector to remove the capsule, capsule, posterior capsule, then it is easy. But if you are doing manual um, with the use of um, rexis forceps, then it is very difficult to do, go beneath, beneath the capsule. So if you are doing manual vitrector, uh, uh, posterior capsule to me, then it is advisable to do before the IL implantation. So this is another case in which the both anterior capsule and posterior capsules are fused together, the membranous type of cataract. In such situations, uh, you can manage anterior and posterior capsule uh, together actually, and cut the um, anterior and posterior capsule with the vitrector. And then since we are not putting IL in this case, I, ma I uh, made a large uh, opening of both the anterior cap posterior capsule together and then for the subsequent IOL implantation later. So now another, this one is a traumatic cataract and we, you don't know the integrity of posterior capsule um, in these situations, uh, only, you know, only after the opening. So uh, the, I did again, pedrectorexis for the opening of the anterior capsule. It was quite fibrotic thick. And then the, uh, after the aspiration of the lens, what I found was there was a thick plaque beyond the posterior capsule and at the uh, at the same time, the anterior and posterior capsule was fused together in that part. And that's why there was no proper back to implant the intraocular lens. In this situation, uh, uh, I put uh, the lens in the sulcus. And um, so three-piece foldable I will sometimes is available. Sometimes it's difficult to available in uh, our setup. So we put uh, our own uh, product, our own IL lab product. So this is the, this is, Mm, the lens that I used. And then after that, I went beneath the, um, beneath the lens to remove that plaque that is fused anterior and posterior capsule because of the trauma, which I knew only after opening of the cortex. 
And this is one of the cases in we sometimes very rarely now these days, previously we used to put a lot of PMMA lenses, and now we have left using the PMA lenses, but this is also one technique that I just wanted to show. This is a post-traumatic cataract and the, the lens was removed in the first setting and then there was a thick uh, uh, fibrotic membrane had developed in the posterior capsule. So in these situations, what I did, I made the scleral tunnel and put the PMMA lenses. This is useful where there is uh, difficult to find out foldable acrylic lenses. And and then they did the posterior capsule to me, which can be done easily even when you use the PMM lenses. This is another case. So in summary, I just want to uh, tell that posterior capsule management is one of the most important steps in successful cataract surgery in children. And age is an important deciding factor. And surgeons can choose a suitable option depending on the individual case available facilities and their level of experience. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. You know, those, the, uh, these were just excellent, excellent talks. I just couldn't be any happier. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we had some excellent questions. So we're going to address a few of those questions. Uh, before I start, uh, Ramesh, uh, are you on? Um, I don't know if you had to leave. Um, the lens floating back up, uh, you know, I actually had a similar situation where the lens, uh, I dropped the lens, uh, you know, uh, putting an IOL after you do capsule, uh, capsulotomy and vitrectomy. Uh, and if uh, sometimes if you don't put enough viscoelastic, uh, the lens can, um, and it can, can drop, uh, especially if it gets tilted and I'm pointing wrong direction. Um, but I had a situation where I actually uh, floated up and, uh, it was, um, uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, he he was able to share that. Okay, uh, so first question is that in case that you don't have a portable keratometer, and many places don't have a portable keratometers because these things can cost, you know, five thousand to ten thousand um, uh, dollars. What did you do, um, Sirijana? Uh, thank you, Doctor Su, for the question. Yeah. So, if it's not available, we rely on uh, axial length only. Yeah. So that is a basic thing that is required even in adult cataract surgery. So if it is not there, the portable keratometer, you can just use the portable, You which most of the time the axial length uh, A scans are portable ones. So you can use that and measure the IOL and use on the formula that is called dance formula, which is available of which I most of the time use. And, and according to the age of the child, like reduce by 10%. Um, uh, if it is less than two years, reduced by 20% and if you, between the 10 between two years to 10 uh, eight years reduce the IOL power whatever comes uh, to 10% and after eight years you don't so, just put yeah gold. so I'm going to keep it like very simple yes uh, you know I, I, I agree uh, the uh, I think these are definitely possible uh, because I've actually done um, medical mission programs all over the world and mm -hmm. there are some places that just don't have a portable uh, keratometer and I typically use an average uh, somewhere between 44, 43 to 44 um, mm -hmm. as a guesstimation. But the axial length is important because that's the main factor that determines the, uh, the power. But uh, there, uh, the, there are many people that I know would approximate uh, the IOL power. Um, and how do you uh, control the post-op inflammation? Uh, Ramesh, I think, is, uh, I think you may have left. So, uh, Surizana? I'm just yeah. gonna ask, how do you control yeah. the post op inflammation? Try to keep the answer simple. We're gonna yeah, go yeah. through so, a few questions. Yeah. So we just put regularly, we put steroid drops every, we tell the patient to put every one hour so that they can put in every two or three hours. That's that's how we practice. And then four times a day, uh, antibiotic. And we, we use mediatrics three times a day. And we just follow after three or four days. And if the inflammation, because most of the time, the first post-operative day will be clear and the inflammation start to grow in three or four days. And you call the patient at that time. If you start the signs of inflammation, just start with oral cortisone. That is how I manage. And most of the time it works. Uh, as you can see, uh, Surijana is a very passionate person and she can't keep the answer very short. Uh, but <laughs> yes, post-op inflammation is a is a, a significant problem for pediatrics and there are uh, different ways of addressing it. And I typically inject uh, intracameral tracens or subconjunctival or subtenon uh, canalogs. Yes. Uh, but yes. if you don't have that available, then frequent topical steroid drops are crucial, uh, is crucial. And then um, 
the um, for people with the uh, who use PMMA lenses, uh, what's the size of the eye wall imp implanted? The size is uh, the optic diameter is six millimeter most yeah. of the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for us uh, in US, uh, we don't have that option of like getting different lens uh, diameters. It's pretty standard. So if you have a patient with the microphthalmic or a smaller eye, you may not be able to place a PMMA. May not, but it. but our lab, if we request, if you request, they can make five millimeter as well. Sometimes yeah, yeah. we use five millimeter. Yes. Yeah, Sirijana is a, in a very unique situation. So they make their own eye wells, uh, you know, extremely cost effective. So um, unfortunately, most of us are not in that situation. Um, I'm going to uh, go through, go um, more, uh, just one last question. There's so many questions. Um, and for the future, um, uh, for the future um, uh, cyber site um, webinar, I think we're going to give a talk for 30 minutes and then address these questions because there are so many great questions um, yes. and that we just don't have um, uh, time to address. Multifocal yes. IOL. Uh, what do you think, Surajana? Um, yeah, I use multifocal IOLs in older children only, not in the smaller children, like after eight, nine years, uh, most of the time. And or you can use after four, five years when they start to go to schools and so something like that, but not in the younger children, because these are the lenses which we are using very newer. These are new things that in uh, it has been introduced in our country for last four, five years only. So that's why in older children we use. So one of the things that Ramesh uh, brought up, I think it's extremely crucial, is uh, getting rid of the, um, the epithelial cells underneath the, post, uh, the anterior capsule. Uh, if you don't remove, if you're not meticulous in removing those uh, epithelial cells, uh, they can develop a significant phimosis or significant opacities, and they can easily result in decentrations. And these multifocal IOLs or, or any type of uh, IOLs uh, that uh, that uh, helps you with the um, uh, the lack of accommodation. Centration is extremely critical. Yes. Uh, and the uh, so any just even slightest decentrations can cause a blurring effect. Uh, so uh, if you are considering it, uh, make sure that you have a very stable and um, uh, 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 the uh, that's well formed anterior capsule, and make sure you remove. Uh, any of the the epithelial epithelial cells underneath the intercapsule. Yes. But if the case did not go well, and if you don't, if you're not confident that the lens is going to be centered, or uh, if you uh, uh, if you weren't able to remove all the uh, the epithelial cells, and I would advise against it. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And I, uh, I you know, I'm so glad there's there's so many uh, great uh, questions, and I, obviously this is a topic that many people have interested in. And we will arrange a uh, future uh, meeting with our excellent speakers, and hope to see you. And again, I just want to say that thank you very much for all your support for Orbis, and we are um, gearing up uh, to uh, for another exciting year um, in 2024. So I hope to I get to see many of you and uh, in person. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shurjana. Great job. Thank you. And Thank Ramesh, you. Ramesh, great job. Thank you. Thank you so much.